morning and happy Memorial Day weekend. If you guys would stand with us as we sing.
73, 25 says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And recently we've been talking about Job and how things were thrown at Job that didn't necessarily go with his plans. And they were hard things and they hurt. And it was difficult to understand where God was going with these things and understanding if he was truly still there and um, helping him through the situations. And um, this next song is called Give Me Faith. And I love the chorus. It's basically like a prayer. Give me faith to trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. And um, what we just read, we sing in the bridge that says, because I may be weak, your spirit is strong in me, and my flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. And that goes for any circumstance, um, whether good or bad. We have a God who's sovereign and will not fail us. me 
Thank you so much for being that good, good father. And I'm thankful, Lord, that um, that you see beyond what we do and in situations we may not understand. But like we just sang, God, that you give the answers before we even ask. We thank you for that, God. Thank you that you are sovereign. In your name we pray. Amen. You may all be seated.
Amen. Thanks so much, Melanie and crew. What a fantastic morning on this Memorial Weekend. And I just had a couple quick announcements uh, that I wanted to share with you this morning. One is you'll see the red friendship folder. And if you don't mind just passing that down, make sure you sign it. If there's updated contact information, please let us know. And then the other one is our D6 materials. And as you know, our church uh, does this curriculum based on Deuteronomy 6. And this concept that no matter what age you are here at Waypoint, that we kind of uh, use the same topics, some of the same scripture passages, so that we can grow together. Uh, and heading in the same direction together. So those materials are now available just outside the office in the lobby. So make sure you pick one up, uh, pick one up to, to hand to a friend. And then we have a special announcement, and I want to invite uh, Margie Gratton, uh, come on up here, and you've seen her at the Welcome Center, you know her from greeting, and here she is to talk about women's ministry. Thank you. If you were here last week, you would probably recall that there was a short video about uh, a ministry called Come to the Table. And that ministry is going to start in just a few days, in June. And the idea behind this ministry is for six ladies to be able to gather together just for about two hours once a month for maybe three to six months and share a meal while they enjoy conversation together and get to know each other better. You may be someone who has looked across the con congregation and uh, noted a woman that you don't know, and you may have thought to yourself, hmm, I wonder who that is, and I wonder how long she's been attending Waypoint. Well, I have good news for you. Uh, this ministry is just for you, because it's a great opportunity to get to know someone that might not be presently in your circle of friends. One of the good things about Come to the Table is that it's a very non-threatening way to get to know other ladies. And there are already five ladies who have uh, volunteered to host either lunch or dinner in their homes once a month. So all you need to do is show up. And um, there are several uh, different times and places that are available. So if you uh, cannot make lunch, you can sign up for an evening meal, which would be a simple meal with five other ladies, and uh, get to know them that way. And it's only for three to six months, so it's not a long-term commitment. It's not like you're signing up until death do us part. You know, it's, it's a short commitment, so I think most of you could do it. And then finally, if you are one of these people who know that you're gonna be on vacation and you've hesitated to sign up because you think, well, I'm gonna be gone, don't let that stop you. The hostesses are gonna be very flexible when it comes to arranging lunches around schedules. There's a sign-up sheet in the, uh, in the, at the Welcome Center, and so I would encourage you to sign up. Uh, if you have questions, I'm sure that Kathy Miller, who is the head of our women's ministry, would be glad to answer any questions you have, or if you can't find her, I would try to answer your questions. Make sure you sign up today because it starts in June, and um, I guess that's all I have to say. I, I plan to be one of uh, the people that is part of this ministry, so I would be glad to get to know some of you better. Thank you. Amen. We got, we got some great days ahead, and uh, hey, I'm still good for leftovers on some of those meals, right? I mean, that uh, sounds amazing. Hey, uh, I want to invite the ushers, those serving us by collecting uh, gifts, tithes, and offerings to come forward, and let's just pray a prayer of dedication as, as they do. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you so much for your presence in this place and for all the countless ways that you bless us. Lord, and I pray that you bless both the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thanks, guys. Uh, we're so very blessed. And this, of course, is Memorial Weekend. And, and part of our calling as followers of God is to live lives of gratitude. It's to be thankful for, for what we've been blessed with, what we've been given, what we have. And, and to realize that it doesn't all just come, come from us and our own, uh, our own uh, resources. But God has blessed us so much, even giving his only son to die on a cross for me and for you. And so to live lives of gratitude. This weekend, of course, our, our country takes time to, to say thanks and to reflect and to remember. And our freedom that we have, of course, came with, with a very great price. And so this weekend is set aside for reflecting and remembering of those who gave their lives so that we could have the freedoms that we do have. And I want to invite Tom uh, Chester to come on up here. And Tom is going to do a reading, uh, himself a, a veteran, a, a Marine veteran. He's going to do a reading called In Flanders Fields. And he'll tell you a, a little bit about it. And it was written during World War I and a great way for us to reflect and remember. Thank you, Pastor. A hundred years ago next week, the British Army stood at a place called the Somme in France. And if you look around this room, entire villages and cities had every male in it killed. The British had 48,000 dead on one day. And a man who survived that war later on wrote a poem called In Flanders Fields. If you wonder why, when you go to the supermarket, people ask you to buy a red poppy on Memorial Day, the reason is the red poppy became the symbol of the Allied effort against the Germans in World War I, and it continued on as a celebration of Memorial Day, which we added to the Memorial Day we used to celebrate the Civil War and all the wars that we fought. Uh, as Pastor said, freedom isn't free. Somebody paid for it, and you never want to forget that. A lieutenant colonel in the Canadian Army who was a doctor, after a, a day of trying to put people back together again and failing in many cases, sat down at sunset in September of 1915 and wrote this poem. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row. That mark our place, and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard among the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, and saw sunsets glow. We were loved and we loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from falling hands we throw this torch. Be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. And another poem said, so nigh is grandeur to our dust, so near is God to man, when duty whispers low, thou must, the Christian replies, I can. Let's pray. Father God, we humble ourselves before you. And God, we thank you so much for your presence here in this place. God, it is our absolute heart's desire that we would live lives of gratitude. God, that we would, we would remember what's been done for us on our behalf, and that in turn, we would, we would live lives overflowing with thanksgiving. And so, Lord, help us on this weekend to take time, set aside time, to be thankful for, for the price that was paid, for our freedom, for our lives, and God, even for our salvation because of you. God, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we confess that we have sinned. And we are deeply grieved as we remember the wickedness of our past lives. We have sinned against you, your holiness, and your love. And we deserve only your indignation and anger. We sincerely repent and we are genuinely sorry for all wrongdoing and every failure to do the things we should. Our hearts are grieved and we acknowledge that we are hopeless without your grace. 
have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us, cleanse us, give us strength to serve and please you in newness of life and to honor and praise your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. What I've just prayed is what we know as the general confession for the communion liturgy or for our communion service. This morning, as we take a look at the last chapter of Job, at the end of Job, I think we will see the connection between the lessons we might learn from Job and our practice of communion. And we will be weaving different parts of the communion liturgy into the next few minutes. My prayer is that it would be meaningful for us, but most importantly, pleasing to God. In the Free Methodist Church, we practice what is known as open communion. What that means is that you do not need to be a member of the Free Methodist Church in order to take communion here. The invitation to join in communion is for all who are in right relationship with God and in right relationship with others. In fact, here is the invitation. You who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who live in love and peace with your neighbors, and who intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and humbly kneeling, make your honest confession to Almighty God. My personal invitation is that we would all into the spirit of communion as we look at this last chapter of Job. For the last few weeks, our pastors have been walking us through the book of Job, and I give them credit because Job is not a very fun book to preach. A lot of Job is about extreme suffering that doesn't seem to make sense and about friends who aren't very helpful at all. I have the privilege of, of trying to wrap all that up. I, I, was, I was thinking about it. I, I have the, the privilege of the fairy tale ending, which isn't a fairy tale ending at all. And in fact, we have a little bit of work to do before we get to the, the good part at the end. My prayer is that our time of communion wrong page sometimes we spend too much time on why questions I do IT work during the week for, for a company and and sometimes on weekends and sometimes at night but one of the things that I say that annoy people I say lots of things that annoy people but one of the things that I say that annoys people is that sometimes I don't like to spend a lot of time on why questions especially when it comes to computers. Somebody will say, well, why did it do that? And I say, I'm not going to stop. And I, I don't know. And I'm not going to worry about it. If it happens again, then we might have to figure out the whys. But otherwise, let's just move on and see what happens. Sometimes I think we spend too much time on why questions. Sometimes it's necessary. But sometimes I think we spend a little bit too much time. For example, I think that we can apply the same idea to the understanding the book of Job. We can ask why bad things happen to good people, but maybe, just maybe, it would be more helpful if we spent more time on how we should respond when bad things happen. But why do bad things happen? I'm going to talk about this very quickly. Sometimes they are natural consequences of our own choices and decisions, whether we want to admit that or not. Sometimes what happens to us are the natural consequences of the choices or decisions of someone else. You see, your choices and decisions, and may I be so bold as to say, when you sin, it, it affects others as well. But can we, can we wrap our mind around this? Just hold on to this with me. God allows bad things to happen because he loves us. Can we, can we deal with that? Can we, can we think that? I mean, it's, not, it's, it's very difficult teaching, I know. But God allows bad things to happen because he loves us. I know it's cliche, but God is more concerned with your character than he is with your comfort. I know you've heard it before, and it's, you know, maybe it's a Facebook meme or something, but God is more concerned with your character than he is your comfort. Character is built through trials and testing 
and sometimes through suffering. God loves us so much that he will try us and test us, sometimes through that intense suffering, so that we will grow in character to be more like Christ. We see this in Job. This is, this is the theme of Job. Job was a good man, a righteous man. In fact, remember, God himself endorses Job, and he says, he says this. He said, there is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. That'll go on a resume. Right? Wouldn't you like God to say even just a little bit about that, feel that way about you? Just, let's just say a little bit about that about me. There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. God. But God allows Satan to cause Job intense suffering, basically the loss of everything that you can imagine. And why did he do that? Because God was interested in continuing to grow Job's character. So what Satan intended for evil, God used for his perfect purposes to build into Job's character. And you might ask where Job needed to grow, and we find that answer, at least some hints of that answer, in the first verses of chapter 32 of Job. Job was faithful to God. God himself said he was. But there was just a little bit of self-righteousness in Job. There was a tendency for Job to justify himself rather than to justify or give credit to God. Sometimes bad things happen to good people because God loves us and needs to test and try us in order to continue our growth. But how should we respond when bad things happen? Let's read the first verses of the last chapter of Job. First six verses. Then Job replied, re replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Remember, this is Job replying to God. He said, you asked, God, you asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Here's Job's confession. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, God, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. I was reading through the D6 material for this week or for next week, maybe. And some of you may have already seen it, or if not, you might see it tomorrow. But there's a warning. Don't you like it when a Bible study comes with a warning? It says this, and I'm quoting, Warning. These are not easy principles to apply. Be prepared to get a little bit uncomfortable. Let the word of God speak, the Holy Spirit convict, and the power of God transform. You've been warned. So how should we respond when bad things happen? Confess and repent. Confess and repent. When bad things happened to Job, Job did not curse God. He could not imagine or think of any known sin in his life or any bad choices he had made, except, except we read that Job confesses that he wanted to be his own God just a little bit. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. This is Satan's greatest lie, you understand. You will be like God. That's what he told them in the Garden of Eden. You will be like God. And God saw that Job had some of that tendency that needed to be purified. So Job confesses this when God reveals to him, if I may paraphrase, Job confessed that God is God and I am not. God is God and I am not. Friends, confession is necessary in our relationship with God. We have examples after example after example of biblical heroes asking God even to reveal hidden or secret sins so that they could be confessed and taken care of. 
Sometimes confession is as simple but as profound as when we realize and declare that God is God and I am not. The Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray is a prayer of confession and repentance. Pray it with me if you know it, and if you don't know the exact words, that's okay. God will hear you anyway. Pray with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. You are God and I am not. Sometimes bad things happen to good people because God wants to create growth opportunities for us. How should we respond with confession and repentance? When we, are confess, when we confess something, we are acknowledging that area of growth that God has revealed to us. Now, let me stop right there. I was sharing this focus of confession and repentance with the worship team Thursday night when we were here, and, and someone asked if this was one of those, those sermons where I was going to beat people up. I said, no, that's, that's never my intent. I mean, nobody wants to be accused of beating somebody up, right? And it really isn't, isn't the intent. But I thought more about that question. I thought more about, about, about why that question, where that question, you know, the, the spirit of that question. And, and the fact is that deciding to confess, going through this process of confession and repentance sometimes is going to feel like we're being beat up by the very conviction of the Holy Spirit. Remember the warning from D6? These are not easy principles to apply. Be prepared to get a little bit uncomfortable. See, they're putting it really nicely. Let the Word of God speak, the Holy Spirit convict, and the power of God transform. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that being beat up by the conviction of the Holy Spirit is fun. It's not. It's no fun at all sometimes. But it is good. It is necessary. There is a purpose to it that we may struggle to understand or even accept. The good news is that God is God, and I am not, and I can trust Him enough to love me through it. And if we'll grow through it, if we'll allow God to work in our lives, we'll see how the pain and the struggle were worth the character that God is developing in us. To repent means to be genuinely sorry. Sorry to the point of wanting to change. If I do something that I need to be sorry for, if, I, if God reveals something that needs to change in my life, in my attitude, in my relationship with Him, and I say I'm sorry, but I keep doing it, how sorry am I really? To repent means to be genuinely sorry and to want to change. To repent means to be genuinely sorry and to want to change. To allow God to continue to change us and grow us. Oscar Wilde said that the truth is rarely pure and never simple. The Bible gives us the truth of this pattern of, of this growth pattern of confession and repentance. And it sounds simple, but in reality is anything but simple. Do you suppose Job thought it was simple to lose everything? Was it simple to have his friends accuse him of unconfessed sin? Was it simple to have his own physical body just covered with sores to where he had to scrape them off. No, it's not simple and it's not easy. But it's worth it. 
Job's confession is wrapped up in repentance. He said, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. My ears had heard of you. I love that language. My ears had heard of you. I, I knew about you. I'd heard of you. But now my eyes have seen you. Isaiah said it this way, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Or how about this from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And don't forget this last sentence. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Pray with me. O Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who with great mercy has promised forgiveness to all who turn to you with hearty repentance and true faith, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from our sins. Make us strong and faithful in all goodness and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Are you starting to catch the pattern here? God uses suffering to teach us Confession is acknowledging that I need to learn, that I need to grow and, and change by God's grace. In the presence of God, the revelation of all my own shortcomings is painful. The weight of my own inadequacy drives me to my knees and puts my face in the dirt. God's light and the conviction of the Holy Spirit are unbearable to my soul. this is not the end of the pattern. It might feel like it's the end, but it's not. It was the end of Job, but it was the beginning of letting God be God. One of my favorite things about being a Christ follower, and I've said this, you maybe, maybe you've heard me say this before, one of my favorite things about being a Christ follower is that what I do next is more important than what I did before. What I do next is more important than what I did before. If I get to the end of me and I can let God be God in my life, it's a new beginning. It's a new relationship. It's fresher. It's deeper and deeper with God. And that's what God wants. There is a promise that comes with confession and repentance, the promise of God's care and restoration. One place we can see this, you see it over and over and again in, in God's word, one place that you can see this, and it's a verse that came to mind when I first started looking at this this, this week, is Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin, their sin and will heal their land. I underlined some words because I, I, as I was kind of parsing this out, as I was kind of analyzing this, very familiar verses, it, it struck me that God's part is a, is a promise. God's part is a promise. Our part is a choice. God says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts, etc., he says, if my people, there's the choice, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, here's the promise again, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The choice is ours. God will be God. You, you, don't, you don't have any say over that, by the way. Whether you think you have a say over that, you, you, you really don't. God will be God. What we have to decide is how and when we are going to get to the end of ourselves so that God can draw us deeper and deeper into our relationship with him. 
Let me give you a really short version of what happens in the, the rest of the end of Job, the rest of the, the last book of Job, last chapter of Job. God tells Job's friends to sacrifice, to confess and repent. Then Job prays for those friends. And, and I was telling some of the staff this morning, I think there's a whole other sermon in that little bit right there. Job was not restored until he had prayed for his friends. It's worth thinking about. After that, God restored all that Job had lost and more. Verse 12 tells us that the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. Cast all your cares on him. He cares for you. Confession, repentance, forgiveness, restoration. This is the lesson of Job, and we see it mirrored as we remember Christ's sacrifice through communion. Even as I've been preparing for this morning, I have been so thankful for how this teaching of God's, this teaching me of, from God has given me a fresh look at communion. I hope it's the same for you. The liturgy, which, is, which means the format of our communion time, walks us through this idea of confession, repentance, forgiveness, and healing. You'll hear it over and over again through the different parts and the different prayers. And here's the next one. Pray with me. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Continuing in prayer, it is always right and proper and our moral duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. Let me back up. It is always right and proper and our moral duty that we should in the good times and in the good places. No. Can we get to a point where we can where we can thank God in all the places, in all the things. It is always right and proper and our moral duty that we should at all times, good and bad, and in all places, good and bad, give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with the inhabitants of heaven, we honor and adore your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Amen. Listen for words of repentance as I continue praying. We do not come to this your table, O merciful Lord, with self-confidence and pride, trusting in our own righteousness, but we trust in your great and many mercies. You are God, and I am not. We are not worthy to gather the crumbs from under your table, but you, O oh Lord, are unchanging in your mercy, and your nature is love. Grant us, therefore, God of mercy, God of grace, so to eat at this your table, that we may receive in spirit and in truth the body of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and the merits of his shed blood, so that we may live and grow in his likeness, and being washed and cleansed through his most precious blood, we may evermore live in him and he in us. Amen. At this time, if I could ask those who will be helping us, um, assisting and serving, if I could ask them to come forward. We will consecrate the elements, and then we'll ask that you come down the inside aisles and then kind of out the outside aisles just to kind of keep traffic flowing. If you will hold the elements and be in prayer until all are served, we will receive them together. If you are not able to come up, maybe just raise your hand or have someone let us know and we'll be glad to serve you where you are. My prayer, my prayer is that our time of communion will be the end of ourselves. 
and the beginning of new life in Christ by the grace and goodness of God with the help of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, heavenly Fa our Heavenly Father, who gave in love your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who by his sacrifice offered once for all did provide a full, perfect, and sufficient atonement for the sins of the whole world, we come now to your table in obedience to your Son, Jesus Christ, who in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we humbly ask and grant that we, receiving this bread and this cup as he commanded, and in the memory of his passion and death, may partake of his most blessed body and blood. In the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Please come, be served, enter into the communion of our Lord.
for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Remember what Jesus did for us. Confess, repent, accept forgiveness, and be healed. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Take it, eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed upon him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Continuing in an attitude of prayer. If you are going through any kind of suffering, first of all, you're, you're not the only one. That's what Satan would want you to think, that you're all alone in this, and you're not. But if you're going through any kind of suffering, God cares. God cares. He cares more than you can ever imagine or understand. If you think, if you're hearing a voice in your head that says God couldn't possibly accept you wherever you're at right now, God couldn't possibly deal with that that you're dealing with. That's a lie of Satan, and I pray that we will see through that lie right now. God cares. God knows. I love the illustration that comes out of Malachi where God is the refiner of silver and gold. We are, you are, the precious material that he is working with. The process to take impurities out of silver and gold are to heat them up to intense temperatures so that the impurities separate from the pure metal, the precious metal. God is the purifier. We are his precious material. I thank God for his care for me. I thank God for his care for us. Care enough even to walk us through this intense process of purification. Would you please stand with me? May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God the Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be yours now and forever. Amen and amen. Thank you so much.